So our next keynote speaker, I'm delighted to both introduce and welcome uh, Jen Rexford. Um, she is uh, the Gordon Y.S. Wu Professor at Eng of Engineering uh, and the Chairwoman of the Computer Science Department at Princeton uh, University. Uh, she has been a leader uh, of SDN uh, since very, very beginning. Uh, she's also the co-founder of P4 Consortium. Uh, she served on the ONF board and on and on and on. Uh, I can, and I had a pleasure of working with her in different capacities and thoroughly enjoy that. Um, she is a recipient of the SICCOM Lifetime Achievement Award as well as the IEEE Internet Award. So Jen, uh, again, thanks so much. Welcome and look forward to your talk. Please take it away. Thanks so much, Guru. It's a pleasure to be here. What I'm going to talk about today is some work we've been doing at Princeton recently on trying to push the limits on the kind of telemetry we can do in a data plane. And it's part of a larger effort to take advantage of a really exciting trend where now with programmable data planes, we finally have programmability in the network from top to bottom and from end to end, from the central controller to the logical agent that runs on switches or NICs, all the way down to the packet processing, and from end to end from where users connect to the internet, for example, on 5G networks, all the way to the services they access. And so in the Pronto project between Princeton, Stanford, Cornell, and the Open Networking Foundation, we're looking at how this can put network owners in charge of what functionality they have and where. And in particular, we think that people want to run their networks better, will take advantage of this programmability to create new ways of controlling their networks, new dials for measuring network behavior, and new knobs for controlling that behavior and then be able finally to put that functionality where it belongs rather than where they've been told they're allowed to put it. And in this talk in particular, I'm gonna focus primarily on the telemetry piece, the collecting and analyzing of the data that drives the decision-making, uh, in part because it's the first step in the control loop. And in part, once you know what's going on in the network, it's often much easier to decide what to do about it. Once you know that there's a cyber attack, the right thing to do is to drop or rate limit it. Once you know there's congestion, the right thing to do is route around it and, and so on. So we're going to focus particularly on enabling richer ways of, of collecting and aggregating measurement data to enable a richer set of control operations. So if you look at, at the network telemetry work that's been going on the last several years, it's been a lot of exciting work in sort of two main directions. One is being able directly in the network data plane to collect, particularly count traffic at different granularities and with different degrees of accuracy. For example, knowing that a pair of IP addresses might have exchanged a certain number of bytes. And that we've gotten better at doing this scalably, including sophisticated data structures that can squeeze into the limited resources that we have in the data plane. And this has proven really useful for particularly a lot of security applications. We've also, through things like in-band network telemetry, gotten better at being able on individual packets to keep track of the experience those packets have in their journey through the network, to say things like what the total queuing delay might have been for a single packet on its entire journey, and then let that information be exported at the end of its journey to some other device that might do analytics. This is also really useful for understanding what's going on in the network, although there's scalability limitations of, of doing this potentially on every packet. In this talk, I want to go up a little bit and ask questions not about traffic counts and about network identifiers like IP addresses, but performance metrics like round trip times and services like Netflix and so on. So I want to be able to aggregate the data directly in the data plane based on these higher level performance and naming abstractions. And that's going to be the, the focus of the talk. And why do we want to do this in the data plane? Well, first of all, there are a lot of applications that need, need information at this granularity. And to collect it outside of the data plane can be actually quite expensive, particularly if you have to export nearly every packet to some other device for monitoring. Sampling is often not very effective in, in some of these kinds of applications. A second reason is privacy. If you can combine what might be sensitive information directly in the data plane and only export the result, or even just act directly on the result, you can avoid having sensitive user data ever seen by anything outside of the network. And I'll give some examples of that in a moment. And then finally, if you can collect this measurement data directly in the data plane, in some cases, you can take the direct action in response to reroute traffic or block traffic based on the analysis you've already done as the packets are flying by. So I'm going to give uh, two examples 
of, of what I think is a, a family of a lot of different examples of this type. And the first idea is going to take us from basic counting of traffic, incrementing counters when a single packet passes through a pipeline of processing, to asking questions about end-to-end -end performance, like round trip times through the network. And this is going to be a little harder because to compute a round trip time, you can't just look at a single packet. You need to look at a packet, store some information about it, and later when it's acknowledged or when a request is, receives a response, you need to be able to combine information about a pair of packets and look at the time between those two packets to know the actual round trip time. So we're going to have to keep a lot more state potentially. It's going to make this more expensive. And we're going to also, as we see, have to grapple with the protocol itself because TCP is a complicated protocol that we can't just simply ignore the dynamics of TCP when, when trying to monitor it. But if we could solve this problem, it would enable a lot of exciting use cases, including fine-grained monitoring of service level agreements, detecting and mitigating interception attacks that hurt user privacy, helping CDNs do dynamic replica selection to direct clients to a better performing replica, infer video quality of the ex experience, which depends on a lot of features, but round trip time is one of the, the really important ones. The second example I'm going to talk about is to talk not about network identifiers like IP addresses or port numbers, but higher level names of services like Netflix or YouTube or CNN. And to do that, we're going to need to be able to join information from the domain name system, in particular the DNS responses that tell a client what IP address to use to contact a particular site, and combine that information with the data traffic that follows. And here too, we're going to see it's not just a matter of combining a pair of information together, but also grappling with some of the details about how the domain name system works and how it's used in practice. But again, if we could do this, it would really enable a lot of exciting applications, measuring traffic by site name or by class of traffic, bypassing certain traffic from an intrusion detection system. For example, maybe the two hour Netflix movie doesn't really need to go through packet by packet through an IDS. We can do things like IoT device fingerprinting that depends on the domains and port numbers that are used by the device. We could identify users circumventing uh, security functionality by doing DNS tunneling uh, and so on. So I'm going to walk through a little bit of detail of how we approach these two applications as sort of exemplars of, of other kinds of higher level or higher order network telemetry that you could imagine, imagine doing directly in the data plane. Now, as you know, the, the data plane is, is much more programmable than ever, but it's still constrained because speed is the real driver of the amount of functionality that can really be done in a programmable way. So there are programmable parsers, there's programmable match action processing and registers to store state, and we're going to make use of all of those. But we're going to have to grapple with the fact that you can't parse arbitrarily deep in a packet, and that's going to be a challenge when we want to parse uh, domain name system packets. The number of registers are limited, so we're not going to be able always to keep state about every flow, let alone every packet, even though some of the applications we're talking about seem to need that. And, and those registers exist and that processing exists, but it's partitioned in high-speed hardware across a number of stages. So these are going to impose constraints on how well we can do this more sophisticated kinds of telemetry. So I'm going to start by talking first about the round trip time monitoring example as a, one of many examples about network performance. And so if you imagine a client talking with a server and a switch that's lying along the path, in this case, we'll consider a switch that's very close to the client that's seeing all of the client's traffic to and from a particular server. TCP starts with a handshake to open the connection and pairs of packets, a packet and then its acknowledgement, provide an opportunity to measure the round trip time between the vantage point and the destination. And in fact, as this communication continues and there's data packets sent and acknowledged, we're going to have opportunities to collect samples throughout the lifetime of the connection to get really fine-grained information, even for long-lived connections, about the evolution of the round-trip time across the life of the connection. Imagine a two-hour Netflix movie where you want to see uh, changes in the quality of experience for the user. You'd be able to do this at a fine granularity by collecting this round-trip time information. And that's our goal. Now, the challenge here is not only that the data plane is limited, but TCP is a really complicated protocol that makes it quite difficult to do accurate and efficient measurement of round trip times. Packets can be retransmitted. They can arrive out of order. Multiple packets for a single connection can be in flight at once. Some of those packets may never receive an individual acknowledgement of their own. Others may experience really long delays before they do receive an acknowledgement. 
And there can be security issues like SIN floods and port scans that could cause a, a measurement device to have to keep a lot of state in order to do monitoring. And in fact, in this case, perhaps never be successful in getting a round trip time measurement. And even when there's just benign traffic, there can be a large amount of it spread across many different connections. So I'm just gonna give you a, a high level sense of how we grapple with that wide set of, of challenges. But just to give you a, a high level sense of how this might work, just imagine a single packet and its acknowledgement. The client sends a packet to the server. It has a sequence number in it that indicates the beginning of the byte stream, the portion of the byte stream contained in this packet, and it has a length. And so this, this packet fits in the byte stream between these two parties from the sequence number to the sequence number plus its length. And later, an acknowledgement packet will come that will acknowledge the last byte of that, uh, that uh, exchange. So when we see that packet come back, we can tell it's associated with the previous packet because they have the same five tuple, if you will, the same identifiers, and the acknowledgement number matches the expected acknowledgement from the data packet. So a simple way to think about collecting round trip times in the data plane is to imagine keeping a table indexed by that information, the flow identifier and the expected acknowledgement. And when a packet comes into the network, we would store it in the table to keep track of the identifier of the packet and this acknowledgement number we're expecting to get later and to store its timestamp. It's in the packet along its very way. Sometime in the future, when an acknowledgement packet comes in the reverse direction, the identifiers are the same and the expected acknowledgement matches. And so this hash table, if you will, will see a match and we'll be able to compute the difference between the two timestamps and recognize that this orange packet experienced 100 millisecond round trip time. And then we can safely remove this information from the data structure to make room for more samples. Okay, so that's a high level idea of how this might work. Unfortunately, it's not sufficient, both in the sense that it's not efficient and in some cases not correct. In particular, because packets can be retransmitted uh, and, and delivered out of order, it's possible that if for some packets, it can be very difficult to get an accurate round trip time measurement. If there are two copies of a packet, which one is getting the yak? We don't really know. If packets are delivered out of order, acknowledgements might not reflect the packets that are received until the full set of sequential packets have gotten in. So we have to make sure we don't collect round trip time measurements that are erroneous when those kinds of things happen. And we do that by keeping a flow table that's gonna keep track for each flow of the range of the byte stream for which we're in the process of collecting uh, round trip time data. So when a new packet comes in, we can identify, hey, this looks like a duplicate packet or an out of order packet, and I need to collapse this measurement range and not collect samples where it's not warranted to do so. And that's gonna be important for us in being able to make sure the technique is correct. And what looks like the expense of extra memory, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. Now, memory is a big issue as well. And in particular, a lot of TCP packets never get an acknowledgement. And so we don't want those to keep polluting the data structure for long periods of time. Though, so what do we do here? Well, whenever a new packet comes in that needs to be put in the data structure, it may have the misfortune of colliding with an existing packet's inf information. It could be that that packet is still waiting for its act, but it could also be that this packet is no longer really relevant anymore. The connection it's a part of has moved on. This packet may never get an act, or even if it does, it may be part of a of a transfer that involved reordering or retransmission. And so we take advantage of this opportunity to either reinsert this packet into the data structure at another location, or to check whether in fact it can just be thrown, this information can be thrown away entirely because it's no longer actually useful. So think of this if you're familiar with the concept of cuckoo hashing. This is essentially an idea of cuckoo hashing with benefits, where you have the option of actually purging the data structure, uh, not just uh, recirculating the data. And we have a bunch of optimizations that don't require actually recirculating the state, but can actually have additional information after the packet table to help us avoid most of the time even needing to, to recirculate the information about the packet. We also have ways of thinking about making sure the flow table doesn't become too big, because we only need to keep information about flows that have valid sampling in progress at this moment. And likewise, we can avoid keeping information about handshake packets like SINs because we are skeptical of, until a connection has really gotten rolling, whether it's actually going to produce valid samples. Now we can avoid having the data structure be overloaded by traffic from adversaries that are attacking the servers on the network. So that's just sort of a really quick high level view of how you can have two data structures, each keeping the other in check. 
allowing each of them to stay small and uh, making sure that the measurements are collected are both fine grained and scalable. So we've deployed um, this idea on traces that we've collected from the Princeton campus network. And in fact, we have a, a pretty wide deployment of, of um, monitoring and Tofina switches at Princeton. They can go to this URL uh, to see more about it. And we've been able to demonstrate that this efficient uh, algorithm for monitoring RTTs can collect the vast majority of the valid samples compared to more expensive software solutions. And um, we also have a prototype in progress on the Tofina switch and we've been evaluating a number of use cases on the data that we have in our campus. In particular, we've been using this technique to monitor both Wi-Fi and wired traffic on our campus and have identified a number of internal uh, latency problems inside the campus for our Wi-Fi users, where in many cases, uh, communication is actually slower inside the campus than it is outside the campus for accessing popular websites. Um, but we've also been looking at using these techniques to detect rapid increases in round trip time that might be indicative of an interception attack where someone's traffic is being misrouted through another country as part of a nation state attack. And we can, in the data plane, detect these kinds of problems within 20 or 30 packets so that we can quickly realize that a user's privacy might be subject uh, to an eavesdropper outside of a country uh, in a short period of time, all because we're doing this at line rate uh, directly in the data plane. So I'm gonna move on to the, the second example, looking at traffic by domain name. And so here we have a different goal. We wanna be able to look at traffic in terms of a domain name or the higher level service that that name is part of. To be able to ask how much of my traffic is Netflix? For example, traffic that ends in netflix.com or nflvideo.net and so on. So the goal is to allow a network administrator to identify classes of traffic by groups of domain names with wildcards and be able to think about match action processing in their head at least in terms of domain names rather than in terms of network identifiers like IP addresses and so on. But of course the actual network traffic is in terms of these network identifiers. And so we have no choice but to join information inside the data plane to match the names that are looked up in the domain name system with the traffic that follows after. And that's what I'm gonna describe next. So, just to review a little bit of how the domain name system works, you have a server on the right here with an IP address 5678. And this server could be a, a CDN server that's hosting a whole bunch of different websites uh, on, on behalf of many different tenants. So you can't assume that that IP address has a one-to-one -one correspondence with a particular domain name. No free lunch. You're going to have to go through that heavy lifting of figuring out when a user makes a request hey, what is the address of netflix.com? And some local DNS server responds with a particular IP address. Only then do we know that for this particular user, the traffic they're about to send corresponds to Netflix. Now this local DNS server may contact other servers to give this answer. It could go to the root DNS server or the Netflix authoritative DNS server, but whatever it does, it eventually gives an answer back to the client. And at that point, the client will set up one or more connections to download data from the site. And we can associate that data traffic seen at the packet level with IP addresses with the name netflix.com. Now we'll have to do this over a long period of time. This communication may go on for a long time and it could involve because of browser or DNS caching, uh, multiple connections that go between that same pair of IP addresses. So that's gonna be where some of the cost of doing this in the data plane will be borne out. So, so how do we do that? So we wanna monitor a particular link in the network we're seeing both the DNS response traffic and the associated data traffic. And we want to join that information together and sum it all up. Unfortunately, again, the data plane has limitations, but network protocols are complicated as well. Domain names are long, nationalgeographic.com. They're variable length. Uh, browsers, as I mentioned, can do DNS caching of their own. And the sessions between endpoints can be very long lived, particularly in, in video applications. And on top of that, there are many clients and services that are concurrently acting in the network. And we're gonna to have to grapple with all of these. So at a high level, what we do is we parse DNS response messages to extract information about who's asking, what name they're asking about, when they asked and what answer they got. And we're going to match that against a match action table that matches on the characters in the domain name star.netflix.com, star.nflvideo.net, and so on. Those are coming from the control plane on a longer timescale, corresponding to the classes of traffic of interest to the network administrator. 
Uh, now we can't do this perfectly because the hardware switches have limitations on how deep they can parse. And so we parsed names up to four parts long, each with up to 15 characters. And we were able that way to get the vast majority of the traffic, but we can't measure everything. A really long name like nationalgeographic.com is gonna be more than 15 characters. And so it's difficult for us to monitor. Fortunately, the popular sites don't use such long names. And we don't wanna store these long names in the data plane, particularly in the re limited register memory we have. So we quickly map those names to identifiers like the number zero that will correspond to Netflix. And then finally, in the last stage, we're gonna keep track of the answer that this client at one, two, three, four, when it communicates with five, six, seven, eight, it's actually talking with domain ID zero. And that's gonna be used to aggregate the traffic for Netflix into a single bucket that I'll show next. Now, this data structure here, this last part, is the expensive part. Many clients talking to many services, potentially for long periods of time. And so here we have to be careful both to make sure that stale information eventually gets evicted, but not so quickly that browser caching will be foiled by it. And we found in practice about 100 second inactivity timeout is sufficient. And second, sometimes we're going to fail to insert into this data structure because we're out of space. And so we keep track for each domain of how many times we fail to insert so that we can compensate for that when we look at the counts we have later. And we find that we're able to do error correction of that type relatively accurately for, for, most, for most sites. So just to give you an example of how the counting works, now let's suppose data traffic is coming between a client and a server. We've already previously put information to say which domain does this traffic correspond to. We can update information about how recently this entry has been accessed so it doesn't get kicked out too early. And we can increment the counts associated with the Netflix bucket. Now we know there's been one Netflix packet and there's been a total of 243 bytes. And whenever the control plane wants information about how much Netflix traffic there is, it can pull the statistics in this final table to say Netflix has uh, this much traffic since the last time I pulled. And so as I mentioned, we're, we're doing the updates here to maintain freshness and then finally getting concise counts of the traffic by the service. Now, we deployed this uh, on the Princeton campus network. We have this running on, on the Barefoot Tofino. Uh, and as I mentioned, we have a number of restrictions because of uh, the fact that it can't parse arbitrarily deep in the packet and can't store arbitrarily long the information about DNS. Uh, we're, but still, even with these restrictions, we're able to monitor the vast majority of the traffic. And just to give you a few highlights on the Princeton campus, um, early in the morning when the students are sleeping, the dominant traffic is Microsoft Teams. Uh, when the students are awake, the video gaming and, and social media applications are, are dominant. And we've also implemented other use cases, including detecting DNS tunneling and doing IoT device fingerprinting uh, on the Tofino as well. And for each of these, we're able to identify security vulnerabilities in the case of DNS tunneling, and we're able to identify the prevalence of devices like Alexa and so on uh, on the Princeton campus. So stepping back, network telemetry is, the, is a critical part of the control loop of running the network. It's really the enabler for knowing what's going on in the network, so then you know what to do about it. Higher order kinds of network telemetry going beyond counting of packets, beyond IP addresses, to things like performance, and the names of services that are running in the network are enablers for an important set of additional control loops where network administrators want to manage performance and manage their services end to end. So we believe that this, this approach to higher order telemetry will enable a rich set of use cases that would be too expensive to run without support from the data plane, but becomes possible with the addition of programmability in the data plane, particularly if we can grapple with the limitations of network state on the device and the vagaries of the network protocols that weren't really designed with network telemetry in mind. And so I'll stop here and happy to take questions. And I just have pointers on this slide to, uh, to papers and slides that go into more detail about the, the two projects that I mentioned uh, and the list of students and, and postdocs that were involved in those projects. So I'd be happy to stop here and take your questions. Hi, Jen. Uh, thank you so much, uh, as always, for a very stimulating and insightful talk. Every time I think I have learned how much you can extract from the data plane measurement, you come up with more ideas of what you can extract and how you can build on it. It's so very exciting. So anyway, I think uh, there are... Uh, uh, 
many questions. Uh, so let me start with those questions from first from the audience. So I don't hog all the time. So I guess the one question that is asked is that in this particular data uh, plane measurement, are you sending all of these measurements to a central location? And then that is where you do all the analysis or some of this analysis is happening in the data plane itself. And what do you send outside the particular switch or the network? Yeah, great question. It depends on the application. For example, if your goal is to detect, um, let's say, a, uh, an interception attack, you might monitor round trip times in the network. And after, the after you get a sample, compute the statistics necessary to know whether there's been a, a surprising increase since the last set of samples you've collected for that communication. And so there we envision doing that directly in the data plane so that we can do change point detection as an analytics module on top directly in the data plane rather than having to export the data uh, to the control plane. For other applications, you might choose to export to the control plane because what you're trying to do is, is inform a network administrator's dashboard or support some higher level application like CDN server selection, whereas where you might want to export that data. One thing that's interesting I, I didn't have time to get at here is when we, when we decide to, that we have to evict information from a data structure. If we know what analysis question we're trying to ask, we have an opportunity to recognize whether this sample will ever be useful for that analysis. And that gives, so doing the analysis in the data plane is not only more efficient, but it can sometimes help us manage the data structure more efficiently because we can recognize early that some piece of information will no longer be relevant. For example, if you're computing the minimum of a set of round trip times, and this packet's been sitting here a long time, it will never be the minimum. And it's okay to it out. So in short, we're doing the analysis in the data plane uh, for any application where you'd like to reduce the data further uh, or take direct action in the data plane. But more generally, certainly exporting some of it to the control plane can be quite valuable too. So, uh, I mean, I guess, but the takeaway is that the amount of data you need to ship it to somewhere else out of the network is relatively bounded. And that is not something that is becoming a limitation in some ways. Exactly. So for example, in this, this uh, DNS example, you could imagine the control plane is just pulling this last array to say, hey, I want to know for Netflix traffic, for education traffic, and so on, how much traffic was there in the last five minutes for those domains? You might pull one set of registers every five minutes. But we've saved you the trouble of having to export all the traffic to be able to understand what the mappings were between the names and the IP addresses. So the amount of data will be extremely modest. So in the context of DNA, there is another question that has to do with uh, encrypted DNS and all of that. So uh, does that become an issue in this context? Yeah, that's a fabulous question. So I think there are two things to think about. DNSSEC does signing of DNS. And so that doesn't get in our way. The information is not encrypted, it's just signed. But you're certainly right. If the data are encrypted, we're out of luck for the particular technique described here. Now, there are other things one can do. For example, TLS connections have what's called SNI or server name indication that's in the TLS handshake that indicates the domain name that is part of the, uh, the TLS connection. And so that's another opportunity to do this kind of work even if the DNS data happen to be encrypted. Um, but more generally, I think it's exciting to think about co-design of these network protocols with data plane telemetry in mind. I mean, we're having to jump through a lot of hoops uh, in part because these protocols like TCP and DNS were designed decades ago before you know, parsability and, and analysis in the data plane was something people thought would ever happen. And so we're having to jump through hoops that are you know, somewhat unnatural. You could imagine a future where co-design makes some of these things a lot easier than, than they've been made here. Yeah, yeah. So another set of questions have to do with like, you put this, if you really imagine an end-to-end -end internet and you are putting this particular thing in part of the network yeah. uh, and you are sampling it in a part of the network, how much of this is uh, really reflecting the total, uh, the behavior of end-to-end -end connection or end-to-end -end application? And you may miss certain patterns or certain uh, behaviors. Yeah, that's also a fabulous question. I mean, the, the worst case is if you're too deep in the network, you might not see all the packets in either or both directions of the flow. So this, particularly the round trip time monitoring makes the most sense close to one of the two endpoints. It's worth noting that even though I showed the monitor close to the client, if you wanted to see the latency between the client and the monitor, there are opportunities to do that with different sets of packets. So when the client sends a data packet and receives an act, it's a chance to see the latency between the monitor and the server. But when the server sends a packet and the client sends an act, we've got a second opportunity to monitor the other half of the connection. And so if we want to understand end-to-end -end behavior, 
uh, we can actually do that by combining information across those two different sets of measurements. And in fact, that is what we did. I, I kind of glossed over this at the end of my slides, but that's what we did in trying to understand Wi-Fi performance on our campus is we measured both the, the latency from the monitor to the wireless client at Princeton and the latency from the monitor to YouTube. And by combining mm -hmm. that information together, we can understand the relative contributions of the two parts of the connection to the latency that the client is. Okay, one last question and then we will have to move on. So general thing is the way you describe your solution and you yourself mentioned it, right? There are so many vagaries and so many uh, optimizations and all of that is going on. And you put certain telemetry and some um, kind of closed loop control into the system. What if you didn't get it right? Uh, so what is the robustness or can you do some damage uh, if you didn't get it right? Uh, any comments on that? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question as well. And I think this opens up a really exciting aspect of network verification. I mean, verification's a, been an exciting topic in the SDN space for a long time. And now we're bringing in the, the, the way the protocols themselves behave like TCP and DNS are now an important part of reasoning about the correctness of the telemetry. So I, I agree, it's a rich space we, we haven't, even really touch the surface of, but I think it'd be exciting uh, to work on those kinds of questions. I totally agree. And I think what I also haven't touched on, what can an adversary do to mess with us? Mm -hmm. uh, and I, th I think that's something else that we, you know, we're starting to think about, but it's certainly not an easy question. An adversary could presumably create workloads that are, that are problematic for some of these algorithms. And you'd either want to operate in an environment where you have defenses against that, um, or have better ways of reasoning about what, what would happen when an adversary does that. Okay, so I think we need to move on. Uh, you may want to look at the, the questions on the Q&A channel and respond yourself as well. Okay, so thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Uh, and let's move on.